Welcome. This week's show with Ecta Call is sponsored by the Embroiderers Guild of America and Sassy Jack Stitchery. A new uh, thing you want to note at the Embroiderers Guild of America is the 22nd Through the Needle's Eye exhibit. This will be displayed virtually at the 2023 National Seminar in Boston and then as a three-month live display in Louisville, then on the EGA website. It'll include member original and adaptation needlework, and the theme is Celebrate the Diversity in Embroidery. Now, this is the 2023 National Seminar, but uh, you need to note that the first step is to get registered, and that registration is open now through December 31. Quite a lead time on this, so get registered now if you want to participate, and all the details are in the events section of the EGA website. And then a new class that is being offered is Lazy Summer Day, taught by Judy Borison Caruso. And registration is open now through August 4. And of course, encourage you to visit the EGAUSA.org website. Lots of free things for non-members. Uh, the gallery is a treat to go through. And on top of all of it, join EGA. You won't regret it. Uh, so much to offer on so many fronts for needleworkers, and uh, worth worth every every penny. So join them, uh, egausa.org. Our other sponsor, Sassy Jack Stitchery, and uh, Kim at Sassy Jack's, uh, Kim and company getting ready to move into their new uh, storefront, the Baird House, in early fall. So we look forward to that. And then, of course, we have projects that we're doing with uh, with Kim and Sassy Jack's, the Marion Lang sampler, the Mary Jane Fry 1861 sampler, the Botany Bay sampler, and the Take Wing sampler. Uh, all of those kits available at the Sassy Jacks website. And now here's an additional word from Kim. Sassy Jacks Stitchery is happy to be a sponsor of Fiber Talk. We so appreciate all the heart that Gary and team put into their show, and we always look forward to each episode. Thank you, Fiber Talk, for all you do for our needlework world. Sassy Jacks is a vibrant needle workshop located in the mountains of western North Carolina, just north of Asheville. We're in the process of moving our shop to its forever home in a historic folk Victorian on the national listing of historic places just three miles down the road from our current location. While we're moving, you can find us in all our normal online haunts, our website at sassyjackstitchery.com, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We can't wait to open our doors and welcome you into our new old home. It was always the plan to be in this beautiful old house, and we've invested a huge chunk of our hearts into its renovation. Every renovated board, every push-button light switch, every old porch swing has lovingly, mostly, <laughs> been placed there with our own hands. It has a wonderful, warm, welcoming feel about the place already, and your stitchy joy and laughter with friends will really make it home for Sassy Jacks. So look for us online for the next few months, as we'll be filling online and phone orders as per usual, and we'll be looking forward to the spring at the Baird House in Asheville, North Carolina. When the time comes, we'll leave the light on for you, just like your mom did when you were a kid, so you'll know it's time to come home. Now on to the show. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week from England, Ecta Call. Ecta, welcome. Hi, Gary. Thank you for having me here. Good to have you with us. Now, uh, I ran into you on Instagram, and you are known for embroidered maps. And that's right. Yeah, and and it was most intriguing to me, and I followed you for a while now, a short while, and every time you post something, it just fascinates me. And I, I have to say that that my initial reaction to embroidered maps was uh, kind of a benefit of the doubt thing, like, well, that's interesting. But as mm -hmm. I as I followed you and thought about it, and then per particularly getting ready to talk to you uh, today, I started to think, what if I did a map? And then I thought, you know, I grew up in a small farm, small farm town in, in Michigan. And I thought, now I get it. If I do a map of my hometown, 
all the memories I could stitch into that map. And, and so my mind just started churning, and, and it really, the light went on, and it really clicked for me as to why, why people want to follow you and, and do these maps. This is, uh, you know, I actually got excited. So how, how, how does this map thing start? First of all, thank you for such a lovely introduction. And I'm so glad that, you know, you, um, you were able to kind of visualize what it would look like if you were to retrace your steps and kind of go back to your, you know, childhood um, and kind of relive those moments through a map. I think for me, uh, maps are primarily storytelling devices, right? So they are beautiful as objects, obviously. Um, but what I love about them is their ability to hold narrative. When we look at maps, you know, historical maps, there's a certain narrative that, that we understand from them, you know, geographic for instance, what places looked like or looked like at, the, at a certain time. But also, if you go one layer deeper, you know, you start to think about who's telling that story and who's the narrator here. And therefore, you know, you start to see the hand of the cartographer, not in just the way objects and places are represented, but also what actually makes it on the map and what is edited out. Isn't it that such an interesting exercise? Um, and as you said, you know, making maps ourselves um, somehow transport us back to a certain place, physical place, but also a state of being like an emotional space as well. So mm -hmm. I think this maps are so multi-layered uh, and to me, making them in textiles hold a particular significance. It's almost like, you know, combining of these two uh, very potent elements. Textiles, as we know, have this fantastic ability to um, evoke emotions like almost instantly. You know, we this is the only material that we sort of spend um, most of our lives with being yeah. engaged and involved so intimately. Um, it's the first thing that we know as babies uh, being wrapped in that. And then the last thing we, have, we when we leave this world. So I think there are our fellow travelers and their ability to, to connect us with um, emotive states or with memories is just incredible and as i was saying to you that for me uh, making maps on textiles is particularly significant because then i'm able to harness um, the ability of not only the material but also what i am saying with the material yeah um in that making maps well in that yeah it's it, there's history there's there's memories there's uh, uh, sense of place, but then mm -hmm. also uh, that the other part that stands out for me when I look at, at your work is the lines and forms that come out of uh, stitching roads and lakes and rivers and so on and so forth. Which which of that speaks to you the most? Is it the art part of of the line shapes and forms, or is it the 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 memories the history part um i think it's probably both okay i mean my, in my work it's line that i'm most interested in and exploring in general my work is very minimalistic and i like to you know it to express what i want to express using sort of the very essence of uh, something. So it's kind of pairing the idea back right to its its most essential and then taking it on um, to, to form, you know, shapes of um, places. But also, you know, I, I feel that um, what I'm trying to, to pursue in my maps is this sense of harmony and balance and like a quiet understated elegance um, and therefore the choice of 
stitches, which are primarily, uh, I use a lot of running stitch in my work, which is like one of the most simple um, stitches. So the idea of simplicity is very much ingrained in um, into the work. And exploring line is a big focus. And the, the place obviously becomes very important, you know, in the places that I'm, try, I'm choosing to make maps of are uh, personally important to me, or if I'm working with uh, cl clients, which are often, you know, private collectors or museums or heritage sector, um, uh, heritage sector organizations, I think in all of this, we are trying to commemorate the place and memories associated with mm -hmm. place. So like last year, just before the pandemic hit, I was on an artist residency in um, Chinatown in Soho, London. And this is, you know, Chinatown has existed in London for um, nearly 200 years or possibly longer. And the brief was to commemorate the place and uh, celebrate the, the hidden stories of the diaspora. So in my research, I found so many um, stories about the place that are often overlooked because it tends to be a touristic district. You know, people come in, uh, enjoy the food and, you know, sites, but not really engage with the history and heritage of the place. So for, for me, it was really interesting to do a map that draws attention to these stories. Mm -hmm. So yes, the, the notion of history is certainly there. Um, and the personal stories or the hidden stories, again, is a beautiful motif that I try and bring into my maps. When when you have students do maps, is I assume that they they tend to do like our my hometown or or uh, some other kind of memory uh, for their maps. Is that pretty typical, or do they tend toward more historic things? I think typical. It, typically, it's um, their own personal, um, personally significant places. So you know, like their hometowns, mm -hmm. or sometimes they would do like a a significant journey, for instance, oh. that meant something to them, um, whether they traveled as a family or, you know, they traveled with their partner. So I think journeys and places are a, 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 a kind of recurring motif Yeah. when the students come and work with me. And I think it's just something so beautiful being able to, to, to revisit places that we have known intimately and, and to be able to, um, you know, have a physical expression of these. I mean, photographs are one, but increasingly they also live on our phones, don't they? We never <laughs> really manage to print any <laughs> right, of those right. out. So we yeah. have these millions of memories of moments spent with our loved ones and in places that we care about, but you know, it, it lives somewhere in the cloud and we, we have no physical reminders of those. So I think making something um, as physical, as tactile as a map um, on cloth become, has like an even added significance in the pre present context. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, furthermore, I think that making something slowly and over a period of time, which obviously with hand stitch you will, it's not something that you would produce instantly as a photograph. And therefore you're, there is more of you involved in the making and the joy that one derives out of it, I think is multifold um, more than say, for example, what clicking a picture might be on our phone. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, well, see, that's and that's the process that I went through once once I got hooked in and I have to admit, I've spent plenty of, of mental energy on on what my hometown map would look like, because mm -hmm. I, I really got hooked into, OK, this, oh, I have to put this friend's house because I have this memory of this friend. So they have to go, uh, you know, and then what, how would I stitch that house? 
and mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, each of the schools, elementary, middle school, and high school, uh, I would have to have because I walked to all of them, and of course that was uphill both ways in the winter. But um, uh, you know, I, so I would have to have the paths that I walked to those schools, and the houses I passed, and so it, it just starts to build in your head. And mm -hmm. and before long, I had a pretty good map laid out in my head of my hometown from my childhood, and it was really a fun mental exercise, uh, just <laughs> just doing that much because yeah. Yeah. and and then the memories it brought back that I that were just you know shoved in the back somewhere. Yeah, right. I mean, you haven't like for for example thought about those things in a very long time, and it's lovely to be reunited uh, with those memories. I think you should make the map, Gary. <laughs> come, well, and, I, come and join me. <laughs> yeah, well, I uh, uh, I think I might at least get pencil and paper out and start to stitch it or draw it out just to see. Because yeah, yeah, uh, it, it was just, it was an unexpected pleasure that I got out of it. And um, uh, and the memories that came back. And, 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 and the thing that I like about the way you go about the maps is a person would think, oh, you know, to stitch a map, you know, what an intimidating project. But the approach you take is really quite simple, and it seems to me rather fast, so that if you wanted to do a fairly large map, it would not be an intimidating project. Indeed. I, I like to keep things very, very simple. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier, that my work aims to be celebrating the idea of simplicity and and that kind of goes right down to my materials stitches and approach and uh, uh yeah as you were saying you know to be able to draw that out and to rewalk those paths again so and then once you have the drawing then it's just a matter of kind of converting or uh, drawing that out on fabric and then beginning to stitch. So um, my students really enjoy that, you know, from, from having had this notion of making a map in their heads for a very long time and then to come for a short course, with, which is typically over two days, they're able to, you know, get that started and, you know, really kind of take that to a stage where mm -hmm. they are able to then progress on to making it themselves. So over over those two days, I introduced them to the way I make maps and I teach them techniques, uh, stitch techniques that lend themselves to cartography very easily, that evoke places effectively. Uh, and then really um, how, how to not only embroider the maps, but also finish them. So it's like, all in all, it's it's a lovely way of kind of condensing that process in a way that it becomes very accessible and it takes the overwhelm out of it. Mm -hmm. do, do do you do most of yours just in one sink in one color, right? Uh, do is that generally how the, how you approach all of this? Uh. Primarily, yes. Um, I love working in monochrome, so I tend to work with a cream background, which often tends to be linen. I, I love working with linen because of its slubby, characterful um, surface. Mm -hmm. and then embroider it in black. But having said that, you know, there, there are several maps that I have worked on in the past uh, and more recently where I have introduced color as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, just recently I worked on a commission for um, a lovely client who asked me to work on four different places uh, on a single map. So the idea was to kind of commemorate four places that have been significant in her partner's life because it was a gift meant for him. Um, so the place that he was born, where he grew up, and then where he went and worked. Uh, so it was almost like, you know, a map of um, 
this person's life. And in that, they wanted particular colors to be introduced, which was a fun exercise for me. So, you know, it's kind of the black and cream um, become an easy framework to, to then start introducing color right. in. Right. But again, it, it stays minimal. It's never like, you know, um, that the color is the big emphasis. It's not. It's, it's very much the line that is the emphasis. And, and to that end, working with monochrome really lends itself to, yeah. to that minimal approach. Yeah. Now, when you have classes, as people mm -hmm. start working on their maps... Does it yes. get does it get quiet because people are reflecting on uh, what they're stitching, or does it get noisy because people start swapping stories? <laughs> I I think it's a lovely mixture of the okay. two. Um, you know, working with stitch yourself, you would know that there are there are phases when we really need to concentrate and we just need to be with our own thoughts. But then, then there there are others where you know it's kind of more of a of a creative exchange. So I I encourage that kind of vibe in my classes that you know they they have reflective pauses built in, but at the same time the the atmosphere is very convivial and it's very warm. It's it's. You know, people aren't told off. <laughs> they start chatting. They start chatting. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, that that is encouraged because I feel, you know, um, and especially during the pandemic when we were all so isolated and not really speaking with very many people, um, it was lovely to have had this community of, you know, other like-minded people who you could sort of geek up with right you could talk about yep. you know different kinds of stitches and materials and yarns <laughs> and also talk about you know creative creative stuff so yeah i think um the, the classes are in a uh, in a way they are the space where uh, you know these sort of creative conversations flow very but equally, you know, if one wants to be yeah. just reflective and quiet, that is also honored. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're very easygoing. And my aim is to create a, a feeling, especially in my online ones, that we are all sitting in a room around a big table and that's just chatting while making work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now you you grew up in in India, That's and right. and uh, for, your first first person from India needleworker I've been able to talk to, and so <laughs> uh, I'm most curious because there's such a style, uh, just textiles in general, such bright colors and such a different style that we get out of India, and uh, uh, learn learn from your your mother grandmother uh, where did your stitching mm -hmm. come from. Um, well, uh, thanks for that question, because it just allows me to revisit my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and share um, about the India that I grew up in. Well, I, uh, as I said, you know, in my first introduction to Stitch was really my mom and my grandma, uh -huh. who lived with us. Um, Till she passed, so I was very lucky to have these um, women, you know, kind of introducing me to making, but in a very sort of gentle, inobtrusive way. You know, it was always always like this fun thing to help out my grandma, who would who would um, make quilts. So she used to kind of salvage any and every fabric. Uh, around the house that was no longer being used and then when her great big bag filled with these <laughs> uh, fabric pieces she would start to make quilts and my mom was although she she had a very busy academic career she was a scientist um, she would 
come back home and in the evening sit uh, and embroider. And I think that was, that must have been her way to de-stress, right? To kind of yeah. tune out of whatever rigors of academia um, and go into a more creative state of being. So I think those were two, my, my uh, introduction to Stitch. But in general, growing up in India, I was so lucky to be surrounded by this uh, heritage of handmade textiles, you know, what my mother wore or what we had at home as bedspreads and quilts were these incredibly uh, made, hand printed, hand woven textiles. Mm -hmm. and, and all of that must have subliminally, you know, subconsciously become part of my, my own artistic um, that said, I mean, you mentioned uh, that, you know, the, the vibrant colors from India are very much known uh, or rather people have seen those kinds of textiles predominantly, uh, they, are, they associate that with Indian textiles. However, there's also a very rich tradition of white on white embroidery. Um, which comes from Lucknow. Uh, it's called Chicken Kari, and it's a white shadow work, which is done on um, semi-translucent fabric, and the, the, the thread also is white. And, and it's just incredibly detailed and beautiful. It's been done for centuries. Then in southern India, there, there is a tradition of wearing um, off-white, just, you know, like cream, uh, draped cloth, often with very subtle gold borders uh, woven in into them. So, you know, those kinds of textiles are not that widely recognized today. However, they have existed uh, for centuries and about, till about 300 years ago, India was the world leader in exporting handmade textiles where they were um, whether they were hand woven or hand printed or embroidered so there is you know a 5000 year old tradition of making uh, textiles which i feel so incredibly lucky to have grown around and really observing and learning from so um yeah, I think that that has had a big influence mm -hmm. in. Yeah, well, that's the that's the thing that now see, that's what I love about doing these conversations is, is yes, living in America my entire life, I have a perception of textiles in India, and that's bright colors, vibrant, you know, gorgeous. Yeah, all, all of those things. And then mm -hmm. but but I never think about it's such a vast country region that there has to be different types of cultures and therefore different types of needlework and yeah. uh and if we're not exposed to them we don't come to appreciate the the other opportunities that there are uh to do different kind like white on white i mean that's one of my favorite things is white work and i would never mm -hmm. have thought of white work coming out of india so yeah well, they Indeed. I mean, as you said, that, you know, there there are certain things that kind of become associated almost like stereotypically. Um, so it's good to break out of those uh, and, you know, kind of widen our horizons. Right. And um, yeah, you're so right. India is not just one country. It's it's a subcontinent. It's a vast, vast a uh, melange of different, I mean, there are like 27 languages, official languages oh with my. their own script, um, spoken and written, and that's just the languages. And then there are um, obviously the, the colloquial versions of things as well. So we are talking about a, a very rich um, heritage in material culture, not just in textiles, but also but what gets talked about, you know, it's interesting who's telling the story. <laughs> <laughs> Come back to that idea of, 
uh, who's the the narrator right uh, yeah and, and what are they choosing to talk about and therefore that becomes popular culture that becomes the popular story associated with a certain place or a culture yeah. so i'm glad that you know there there are passionate people like you who are uh, not following that <laughs> you know <laughs> you you you're actually inviting others from from different influences and backgrounds into your um into your podcast and and then making people aware of other uh ways of thinking and other ways of making so that's fantastic yeah i ha- i have an ongoing problem of curiosity so um mm-hmm. <laughs> it just it, it's okay it's okay so so you get to, so i'm i'm getting this picture of of you have an opportunity to grow up in this uh multi-generational environment where needlework and and art through needle and thread is present yeah. but you weren't mm-hmm. forced to do it you were you were allowed to uh learn and take advantage if you wanted to and so it it, it clearly it spoke to you and and you you picked up and ran with it and uh you know what a great opportunity because you weren't forced and you weren't prevented you you were given the opportunity yeah and you know it was because the, the majority of my family were um in either into academia or you know their my cousins were going and joining med school and they were becoming engineers so just to be kind of rebellious and perverse <laughs> like, <laughs> i am not going to be doing what you guys are doing <laughs> so, <laughs> so therefore i i went and uh, signed up at the uh, at this design school that i'd hardly heard anything about, about so uh yeah no it was very much nurturing you know my my parents never really forced me to do anything they they would have been as happy if i had picked up something else entirely um so i feel very fortunate that i was able to to just follow my curiosity and you know where it led mm-hmm. and initially my training was in apparel design with uh, an emphasis on textile so i i learned uh, how to design and make clothing um also learned how to make textiles but i found increasingly that my my true passion and joy lay in textiles i wasn't so interested in form and exploring form it was uh really the surface that uh, intrigued me and you know i was really excited about creating different types of surfaces so that's what i pursued and after after i i graduated from national institute of design in andabad in india i um came to the uk to do a masters degree in textiles and it, <laughs> it's so funny i I was offered a place at RISD um in the states Rhode Island School of Design mm-hmm. but uh, somehow that didn't quite happen my my plan B was to come to the UK but I got offered this uh, amazing scholarship I was selected for this scholarship that um enabled me to to travel and uh, come and study it was a full scholarship not just my tuition was taken care of but also travel and living expenses so it was like do i want a loan yeah. <laughs> and go to the states <laughs> or or do i want to you know have a fully funded place so i i chose purely based on that <laughs> It's well, very pragmatic. Hey, uh, concern. Money I speaks. Like money business. speaks. You got <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I I landed up in the UK. I I went and studied in Scotland in Edinburgh and um did my ME there where I got the chance to really, you know, just just make things and enjoy the process and learn and experiment. and explore so for me it was just a chance to hone into my own voice my own way of looking at the world 
uh, and the MA provided me with that kind of time where I could just tune out from everything else and then just just focus on my own uh, developing my own work. Yeah. Well, and, and nothing beats being able to go to school and not have to hold down a part-time job just so you can put food on the table. Um, yeah, to, to be able to just immerse yourself in your studies is, uh, uh, is a huge plus. And, and, of course, to go to the U.K., I mean, no, no trouble finding textile art in the U.K. I mean, that's pretty easy to do. So. That's right. Yeah, uh, it was. It yeah. was. Where I, I was, where the college was, you know, it had very easy access to um, Scottish mills. And uh, it was lovely to see, you know, a, like, um, what is it called? Oh, gosh, the, the name has flown out of my head. But <laughs> the the water turns um, in the mill. Have you seen those old-fashioned mills? I, I've um, seen, I've seen them, but yeah. 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 Yeah, it was incredible to see that, you know, in in action right down the road. And um, and Scotland has its own very rich history of textiles. So uh, it was a lovely place to be. And then yeah. I came down to London to first to, to Bath uh, to, to set up my practice uh, and then eventually moved to London, which is where I've been for the last decade or so so and that that's interesting to me too in because uh, uh quite a culture change from india i would assume from india to the uk and certainly to london but it, it obviously mm-hmm. works for you since you've stayed there um do you in your in your artwork do you yes. still does does your indian uh art training still influence uh, work that you do, or is, has it become all one? I mean, how how has that played in your head? I I think it would be very difficult to pinpoint that this influence comes from India and this comes from Scandinavia and this comes okay. from London. Okay. Uh, so it to me it's it's you know it, these. Places have certainly had an influence on my artistic voice, but I can never say that five percent of it is from India and, and twenty five is from there. And mm-hmm. I I'm not even interested in in that kind of investigation. What I'm interested in is the idea um, and how to express it. Yeah. And pursuing the this idea of place i think it just allows me to to reacquaint myself with places in my own memory in my own story but also you know new places that i may not be very familiar with so it becomes a segue into understanding the histories um of places mm-hmm. and it be- like way into understanding, you know, how uh, something has been shaped by time and influences. So um, I find that idea very, very interesting um, as an artist. Yeah. Well, you, you have a statement in your the bio on your website that has right. stuck that has stuck with me: making with meaning. And yeah. and I, I love that because it, uh, it it starts my wheel spinning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think that's primarily, if I were to say it in one sentence, I think it would be that, that, um, you know, I'm, I'm pursuing this idea of meaning. What, what um, meaning does a place hold for us? As you were talking earlier about, uh, you know, this map, where, where you were thinking about your hometown and you were thinking about these paths that you walked on and the friends. That, so it's certainly it has meaning for you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that becomes like the central um, philosophy or what, I, what I'm trying to do uh, within my work is 
to pursue and explore um, how places have a meaning for us and how we like to express it. Like this map that I, I made, one of my earliest maps that I made were a map of Delhi and a map of London because I was trying to, in my own head, um, understand what home means to me. And uh, because these two cities that now I call home were, you know, they are so vastly different in mm -hmm. not only in terms of geography, but also the culture. And, you know, uh, I was essentially trying to understand what it means to call a place home and when does it start any random city? When does it start feeling like home? So the map making really helped me understand that, like to, to illustrate that, let me give you an example. So when I was making the map of Delhi, it was so easy for me. Um, I was able to pinpoint the places uh, that, for instance, you know, there, there are streets where my dad taught me how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, drawing those and, and making those were, were like, you know, kind of revisiting that and um, reliving those memories. And, and that's such a direct way to understand. Like, right? yes, that, that's why it feels like home to me. Um, and as I had kind of moved to London at the time recently, I had a you know, it's not a city that I was born in and grew up in. So making the map of London, I thought, you know, I'll be able to at least understand what I'm trying to, um, you know, why why has this city started to mean so much to me? And it completely took me by surprise. I I hadn't spent that those many years in, in London, and yet I had um, made memories here, you know. So, for instance... Um, in Hyde Park, there was one birthday that I celebrated with my friends, and and just thinking about that made me smile when I when I uh, drew Hyde Park on my map, and then eventually stitched it, and and you know where my studio was, and where my home is, and the walks that I like to take. Um, all, all of those things were suddenly you know manifested in front of me, physically there, visually to see. Uh, and that whole exercise felt so cathartic. I thought I was able to claim the city as my own, you know, to understand it so uh, instant, not instantly, but in, in such a way, in a visual and tactile way. Um, so from there, this little seed of meaning grew. So I was able to find meaning through making something. Uh, and then that has become kind of the central leaf motif of uh -huh. work since then. That's so, it's so interesting because uh, uh, listening to you say that, because we just moved uh, from Illinois to Missouri, from Chicago area to the St. Louis area after 28 years uh, <laughs> uh, in one house. And, and we've been married 43 years. So 43 years in the same wow. uh, area. And yeah. we've had many discussions about that very thing. When, when does a place become home? And because we're going through that transition now. And so and now I, you, you got me going about maps, how, how a map can help illustrate that. Mm -hmm. And oh, what fun. See, that's the, that's the <laughs> thing about these maps that has really hooked me is when you like if i look at a post you put on instagram oh that's an interesting map and i look around and see some of the features and things and but yeah. but it's when you step back and you start to think about the the levels below just the stitching that mm -hmm. are in that map that it really comes to life and it's it's so fun yeah i, I you know i just applaud you i think it's great oh thank you thank you oh, i i think it also takes a certain kindness 
kind of person to respond to them. And I'm so glad that, you know, you've taken to the to map making and, <laughs> and hopefully we'll see you making a map of your new area. And then, you know, that that might help make it home. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah, I start to think about that. Because right now, and, our understanding of the area we live is, is really fairly limited to what yeah. routes we've learned by rote so we can get to the grocery store and our daughter's house and those kinds of things. And you know, over time, you start to branch out. But um, uh, yeah, oh boy, what fun, what fun. Bravo for you, yay. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so when you finished your master's, did, yeah. did that put you in a position to start a business or did you continue with needlework as, as more of a hobby and, and work a job just to make money? How, how did that transition happen? Um, let me think back to what exactly happened. So I was, I was very focused on setting up my practice um, straight away. Okay. So uh, as soon as I graduated, I wanted to, um, I was actually very lucky. I remember at my degree show, which was down in London, every year there 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 is a showcase of all the design graduates in the UK, um, and there's a great big exhibition space where this show takes place. It's called New Designers, and um, people come in. To, to see what's the, the the latest, you know, that creative industry of uh, professionals across board, I mean, curators, artists uh, of all kinds and stripes come in and see this event and really celebrate what the new graduates have been doing. So just from that one show, uh, and I was very fortunate to be selected for that. I, in fact, I was the only master's student selected from my university and there, there were other undergraduate students. So I was spotted by a curator who offered me um, a solo exhibition oh. from that show uh, and also uh, a wonderful store at the time, which uh, was very close to the Victoria and Albert Museum. They also happened to visit this store, uh, this show, and they bought some of my work. So it was even better than I could have ever hoped for <laughs> as, a, as a graduating student that I had an exhibition to walk towards and I had this you know, uh, someone interested enough in my work to buy it straight away. Um, so it re really that got me started. And um, because I was new in the country, I, I didn't really know how things worked here in the UK. Um, but I was, I was just determined to do my own thing and not really have to resort to taking a job up. Wow. Um, so I, I applied for many things. I mean, whatever opportunities were available in the way of, you know, being able to set up a, a small studio and mind you, I didn't have a studio, right? My husband and I were at the time in a one bedroom apartment. Uh -huh. In, the standard uh, in standard Edinburgh. startup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, um, not really knowing much about the way things worked uh, here. And, you know, I, I would just trawl on Google and find out about what, if there were any bursaries or awards going or competitions. Uh, and I chanced upon this award from the Crafts Council in England, which was a, a two year long residency, um, which provided a studio space, a small studio space within a university uh, and also some mentoring support. So that was really, I mean, I made an application, they invited me for an interview and then uh, I got selected for this award, which was amazing because only six people across England and Wales were selected oh. and I one of them. Yay. So, Yay! I know <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> it was it was really cool, and 
uh, so from Edinburgh, I moved to Bath, which is where my residency was going to be at the University of Bath Spa University in the textiles department. Um, and I'm so incredibly grateful for this award, but because really that was my seed capital, right? <laughs> that, uh -huh. that is uh, how I could access equipment and have a studio space to myself. Um, I was asked to do a bit of teaching in return, which was amazing uh, also because I, I love sharing my skills and I love the idea of teaching. I'd seen both my parents do it, their professors, as I said. So, um, you know, my, my childhood was steeped in academia. So it all <laughs> felt like, oh, of course, you, you, why wouldn't you teach at the university? Right, right, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, life sort of came full circle there. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's what I did. That's how I got started. And I was there for um, three years. The next three years, which, which was really from very, very initial stages of thinking about, what, well, what am I going to make? And where am I going to show it? And who, who is going to eventually buy it? All of those questions I did I did have a Saturday job oh yeah I just remembered in a, in a little gallery in Bath mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah but um thanks to the award and the teaching I I was able to um uh, get my business off the ground and get keep keep it going eventually I moved to London as I said about three years later because I found that um all my clients were in London. I was doing all the exhibitions that I was doing. They were in London. Um, and also it was like a more um, vibrant place. I mean, Bath is beautiful. I don't know if you've ever been, but it's very Jane Austen. It's yeah. like Georgian and uh, 17th century. Beautiful, beautiful architecture, but it felt a bit quiet <laughs> for a young couple. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we would find ourselves on the train to London uh, every other weekend and then we, we said like this is ridiculous why are we doing this why don't we just move to London <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> so we did and I, and I think that there, there were a lot of for me you know I'm I'm quite a city girl I love having everything at my doorstep and I love the buzz of living in a big city mm. uh, so for me then when I was in my life at that time, you know, I now I could trade a very quiet countryside. Yep. Oh I oh I'd head to, I'd head to the countryside in a heartbeat. Yep. No Oh yeah. No thanks. So I, now I'm 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 warming up to that. <laughs> yep. But uh yeah, ten years ago it it felt like a really exciting move uh for my husband and I and we did. And um Luckily for us, I think London em embraced us and we embraced London and it's we've never really looked back. It's been um, really, really lovely. I love the idea that, you know, when you when you sit on the, the tube, the underground and you're I'm going to my studio on an average day, I, I hear, you know, 10 different languages being spoken mm -hmm. at the same time. People are all over the world and it's such a melting pot of different cultures um it has some of the the best art uh, museums right at the doorstep so uh, as an artist i feel that you know i feed off a lot from the energy of the place and the vibrance of the place um and it it just works for me um, being immersed in all of that yeah it's an incredible um diverse place and a vibrant place so um yeah can't complain <laughs> well yeah and as an artist constant stimulation from all all quarters is is certainly a plus no doubt yeah um and, and okay so now uh, t teaching now we, we mm -hmm. gotta uh, not, you, you teach maps like people can take classes on, on how to do maps but then you have a uh, uh, other techniques that you teach and i'm most interested in these is it kantha and shibori is that right that's right oh i got them so, right yay yay for me um yay for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh i 
I love teaching and I love this idea of, um, you know, people, you know, helping people connect with their creativity. All of us, I think when, when we are little, we um, are fantastic artists because we don't judge ourselves or we haven't been judged by other humans. Um, but somewhere along the way, you know, most of us get busy and, you know, lose touch with our creativity. So I, I love this idea of reintroducing people to um, expressing themselves through stitch. And map making is certainly one of, uh, one of the ones that I teach regularly. Um, I teach people how to embroider bespoke maps of places that are important to them. But the other... Uh, other interests of mine are Kantha stitches, which is a heritage textile from India. Uh, Kantha textiles are uh, made by layering cast off cloth. So, you know, typically you'd have um, old cotton saris that were too worn out to continue wearing. So, you know, um, women in Bengal. Uh, would layer these sometimes three to five layers of very fine cotton and then stitch them in um, using running stitch primarily but also other several other techniques into these really beautiful textiles that um, have motifs that are narrative so you know often they, they would tell stories about um, daily life but also a lot of motifs are um, drawn from folk tales from mythology from religious iconography so um, these are fantastic as I, I love them because they uh, not only celebrate sustainability in that you know they were repurposing what was to hand and not just throwing it out in the bin um, which is an approach we are only now beginning to cotton on to, isn't it? We're now talking about recycling and yes. repurposing, cycling. But this has been done in um, in India for centuries, and it was. It's unfortunate that it hasn't been recognized as such. But uh, so to me, <laughs> uh, to me, it was my kind of natural choice uh, to to uh, start teaching because one I love running stitch two I love the approach of Kanta three it's um, it's a narrative and um, surface design technique so for me it kind of works on several different layers mm -hmm. and all connects me with my own culture with my own heritage and I get to introduce others who may not necessarily know about it uh, so yeah but the stitch shibori is also uh, another one I mean basically they they are stitch resist textiles shibori is a Japanese word but India also has a phenomenal tradition of uh, resist dyed textiles you might have heard of bandini which are uh, tie and dye textiles so they are like tiny bits of cloth are pinched and then uh, a thread is tied around them and they are immersed in a dye pot later on the, the thread bindings are taken off and the most intricate of uh, patterns emerge mm. so I, I've been very interested in this since my design school days um, and you know teaching them is kind of an opportunity to, to revisit it and explore it in, in multiple different ways. And I teach it using natural dyes. So, you know, the whole process is very much sustainable. It is about using what we have to hand, you know, in our kitchens, in our gardens, without having to resort to um, chemicals. So, yeah, for, for me, again, very, very interesting ideas to uh, introduce people to yeah 
And and I assume uh, you offer these classes in your studio, but these days offering them uh, online also? That's right. Um, initially, before the pandemic, they all used to be in my studio in central London. And last year when the pandemic struck, I think it was towards the end of March here in the UK that we went into the first of many, many lockdowns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys have had a nice parade of those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was literally, I mean, we've slightly lost count of how many we've had. I think it was four, third one, third, three, four, uh, certainly. So yes, we, <laughs> we went into a proper lockdown. I think for the first four months, it was literally like you weren't even allowed to step out of your house uh, other than buying your groceries or you know going for that half an hour of walk so in that scenario doing classes in a physical environment was just not possible and I started teaching online and initially it happened on um, on this idea that I wanted to kind of give back you know um, I was thinking how am I responding to this disaster as an artist? Mm. And um, when I look back at this time in my life, what do I want to remember? You know, do I want to remember as a tragic time or do I want this to mean something else, something more positive for myself? And I chose the latter. And I, I basically decided that I have skills and I am just going to share them. So I started with something that I call Soothing Stitch, which was um, a gathering for people to come together every Friday, absolutely free. Um, and we explored uh, words. Initially, it began with words that you know we found hopeful. So you know, someone chose the word hope, uh, someone else chose nature, whatever, uh, you know, that one little word prompt that would help us uh, connect with something pos positive is how it really began. When I decided to do this completely on a whim, I was just chatting with my husband and saying that, you know, I, I know I have the internet and I ha have my hands, <laughs> but how do I connect? <laughs> uh, and he is... Um, He's a techie. He's he works in AI, artificial intelligence, and you know a world away from me. <laughs> but he suggested, why don't why don't I try Zoom? And I didn't really know what Zoom was at the time. Uh, I was, but these are the levels of my tech savviness. <laughs> I was like, what is Zoom even? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he introduced me to Zoom, and I just put out a post completely on uh, an impulse on Instagram saying like, look, this is what I'm thinking. And if you'd like to join me, you know, just DM me. And literally from, it just exploded from there. You yeah. know, I was suddenly, you know, I had these multiple messages that I, I filled up one um, and then I had to cap it because I didn't really even know how I was, I was going to do it. And I added another <laughs> session in another. And then soon it became like an every Friday thing. And then, you know, these lovely people started asking me, well, what what else do you do? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. Well, I, I could teach this. So really, you know, my uh, first tentative steps in uh, digital teaching happened during the lockdown. And, um, and I must be doing something right because it's sort of gone wrong from strength to strength. Wow. Um, and I've been teaching fairly regularly now for, for the last one and a half years um, online and people from all over the world have been able to join, which I feel so happy about because right. earlier, you know, geography was a challenge. The people who did come to my studio were mostly those who... Uh, who were in and around the UK. I mean, sure, I had some international students, but then, you know, it's a flight and it's travel, all of which certainly limited the, the um, you know, people who could come in for these. But since having started teaching online, 
it's like geography has suddenly you've been able to transcend <laughs> right right no I, that's uh, there's no doubt that is one of the huge pluses out of this yeah. uh, pandemic is just that for uh, people like you it has opened doors to audiences and students yeah. that would yeah. never have been opened otherwise and uh, yeah yeah completely yeah. um and being being someone who uh, likes to to work most of the times with my fingers and and not really someone who lives uh, very comfortably in the digital um, media i think for for me also it has been um uh, it has been getting comfortable with uh, being online and being mm-hmm. able to find a way of teaching and communicating that still has a has a warmth around it still has its humanity um and just being able to connect with others who are um you know who are on a on a creative journey and just being able to help them and guide them has really meant a lot to me um especially during the pandemic yeah and and thank god for technically oriented spouses huh <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank God. Where yeah. would you be? Uh, I, well, certainly not on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. no. All credit to him, honestly. I mean, he when he said, well, you know, uh, how are you going to teach? Why don't you try a multi, multiple device setup? <laughs> that slightly blew my mind. <laughs> like, what do you even mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. So. <laughs> Definitely, well, all the credit of the tech goes directly to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. You're not alone there. Trust me, you're not alone. Uh, not <laughs> at all. Well, Acta, this has been such a treat. Thanks for making time and, and sharing your story. Really have enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a treat equally for me as well. Yep. All right, and thanks to everyone for listening. <laughs> <laughs>